Welcome back to my podcast on theology and religion. In the past few sessions, we have studied the story of the Syrophoenician woman. You may remember that in this pericope, a Gentile woman asks Jesus to heal her demon-possessed daughter. Jesus initially declines to heal her by saying that the children's food should not be thrown to the dogs. The woman replies that even the dogs can eat the crumbs that fall from the children's table. And Jesus responds by commending her faith and declaring her daughter to be healed. In parts 1 through 3 of our study, we use historical criticism to interpret the story of the Syrophoenician woman. We also argue that the story truly occurred in the life of the historical Jesus. Today, we will reflect theologically on the text. This means that we will read the text as sacred scripture rather than just as a historical document. We will reflect on what God is teaching us by reading the passages within the framework of Christian tradition. The Church Fathers are the main sources from which we draw our tradition of interpretation, so we will explore what they have to say about the story. Specifically, we will see how four patristic bishops and monks, spanning from the 4th to the 8th centuries, interpreted the meaning of the story for the spiritual life of Christians. The first church father that we will examine is Hilary of Poitiers, a 4th century bishop who ministered in Gaul. I believe I pronounced that correctly. He thinks that the story foreshadows the salvation of the Gentiles, which is then illustrated by Jesus' healing of the Gentile crowds near Decapolis. Now remember that after Jesus heals the Syrophoenician woman, he then heals um, a big crowd of Gentiles and feeds uh, thousands and thousands of Gentiles miraculously. So Hillary first discusses that healing, and then he asks, quote, what follows immediately after the Gentile people are prefigured in, the, excuse me, prefigured in the daughter of the Canaanite woman? The faithless and the sick are instructed by the believers to fall down and adore. They are made well again, and all the functions of mind and body are being restored for hearing, contemplating, praising, and following the Lord. End quote. As you can see, the sickness and demon possession refer metaphorically to our spiritual condition. At least that's in uh, Hilary of Poitiers' view. The Gentile characters in the story serve as a picture of ourselves. Like them, our minds and bodies are not fit to commune with God because of our spiritual sickness. But after coming to Jesus in faith, we are healed and able to do what we are supposed to do, which is contemplating, praising, and following the Lord. So that's Hilary of Poitiers. So a little after Hilary's time, there was a bishop named Theodore of Mopsuestia. He lived in the 4th and early 5th centuries. Uh, he also develops the idea that the story of the Syrophoenician paints a picture of later non-Jewish Christians. He writes the following, quote, With his accolades, he honors her as presenting a type of the church that is from the Gentiles. Note that he did not say, Let your children be healed, but, excuse me, let your child be healed, but be it done for you as you desire in order to show that it was the power of her faith that elicited the healing. So in this passage, Theodore uses an interpretive technique called typology to determine the significance of the Syrophoenician woman in this story. When he calls her a type of the church that is from the Gentiles, he means that she represents and foreshadows the Gentiles who become Christians. Just as her faith is what brings about the healing, so does the faith of all believing Gentiles who bring, uh, excuse me, so does the faith of all believing Gentiles bring healing to them. Faith in Christ is what healed us. So additionally, we have writings from the 4th century Archbishop of Constantinople, John Chrysostom. He focuses on spiritual practices in his interpretation, specifically the practice of supplication, which is prayer. It's kind of a fancy word for uh, requesting things of God through prayer. So in a sermon on the Gospel of Matthew, Chrysostom uses the Syrophoenician woman as an example of how Christians should pray to God for their needs. Here is what he says, quote, And yet God would have us demand things of him, and for this accounts himself greatly bound to you. And he stayed not at similitudes, but signified it also in his very actions, when he dismissed that Phoenician woman, having filled her with his great gift, for through her he signified that he gives to them that ask earnestly, even the things that pertain not to them. 
for it is not meet, says he, to take the children's bread and give it unto the dogs. But for all that he gave, because she demanded of him earnestly. End quote. So in this excerpt, Chrysostom declares that Christians should demand things from God. So it's a rather shocking thing to think about. We should not just meekly ask God for things in Chrysostom's view. We should demand earnestly to receive what we need. To Chrysostom, the Syrophoenician woman illustrates how Christians should petition God for their needs, not just once or twice, but repeatedly. Recall that in Matthew, the woman continuously calls after Jesus, even when he refuses to help her initially. Chrysostom believes that her persistence plays the determining factor in gaining a response and healing from Jesus. Christians, therefore, should pray fervently because God responds to fervent prayer and is bound to Christians in a deep relationship because of it. Chrysostom's interpretation of the text may seem to contradict the literal or historical meaning of the biblical passages, if you remember from our studies in previous episodes. You may remember that in both Mark and Matthew's account, Jesus heals the woman's daughter because he is impressed by her words or by her faith, not just because she is pestering him for help. However, if we realize that Chrysostom's purpose goes beyond just the historical meaning of the passage, we can see that he is creatively and legitimately interpreting the passage within the context of Orthodox Christian theology, which teaches that we are supposed to ask God repeatedly for what we need. Sorry about that little sound. That must have been my emails. All right, so I just muted my computer. Uh, this way, we can gain insights into what God is teaching us that cannot be done by using historical methods. So we need theological interpretation to get out the maximum uh, appreciation of Scripture at both a human and divine levels. So let's go on to John of Damascus. The Church Fathers also interpreted the text Christologically. John of Damascus, a monk living near the end of the patristic period, understands the text to illustrate Christ's fully human nature. Remember that in Mark's version of the story, Jesus enters the region of Tyre and goes into a house, hoping that no one will find him. John of Damascus' comments on the verses are the following. Quote, Christ's divine will was all-powerful, yet it was said that he was unable to conceal himself when he willed to. Why? It was while willing within the limits of his humanity that he was subject to the limitations of the flesh. As a human, he possessed the common ability to will. The sanctification of his will did not occur by circumventing his natural volition, but by uniting his will with the divine and almighty will as the will of God incarnate. Hence, when he finished, or excuse me, when he wished to be hid, he could not do so of himself because it pleased God that the word be revealed in himself as having the limitations of human willing. In this passage, John of Damascus is trying to understand why Jesus is not able to hide himself successfully in the story, even though he is all-powerful because of his divine will. John's answer is that God, as revealed in Christ, subjects himself to the limits of human nature without compromising his divine nature. In other words, God the Son incarnates himself and becomes just like us, fully human. In John's view, that is how it pleases God to reveal himself to us, just like us, fully human. So that brings us to the end of our study today. We have explored how several church fathers reflected theologically on the Matthean and Markan versions of the story of Jesus and the Syrophoenician woman. We saw how they interpreted the story to teach about faith and Christ and the Gentiles and the church, how to pray to God, and the human nature of Jesus. Exploring the tradition that developed surrounding this passage has allowed us to draw out more truths from it than just studying it historically. I hope that you were edified by this discussion. If you listen to this on YouTube, then I invite you to click the like button, subscribe, and push the notification bell to see more content. You are also welcome to visit my website at jdreiner.com to see more information and posts. And you may also like to consider donating using the links in the description if you want to support my work. Thanks for your attention, and I will see you next time.